yesterday I kind of still was speaking in some kind of generality about how to take some kind of, you know, some kind of Calabi out three situation. You associate it to some moduli space of objects. And it's drive category of cheese or something like that. And then to this, you associate some kind of, you know, homology theory, which is this phi is some perverse sheaf basically obtained by gluing together vanishing cycles. And then you can take its cohomology or you can take its stock and kind of study that. Um, one thing I, I think I forgot to kind of give, you know, I kind of get some attribution in the middle of it, but I mean, just overall this kind of program of kind of going from X to cohomology of M. I mean, this was kind of the work of a lot of people, but the kind of, you know, you know, I was focusing on the contributions of this group at Oxford. So this kind of Oxford group but kind of both before and in parallel, there was also kind of work of, you know, Kai Behrend, you know, already in his original work, he was kind of moving in this direction. And then this work of Kinsevich and Soibelman, all basically discussing this kind of process and, you know, in various settings or various generalities. Okay, so today what I'd like to talk to, uh, talk about <laughs> is now to get to the second part of the, uh, of the title, which is this notion of Gopu Kumar Vafa invariant. And at least in the setting that I'm gonna be interested in, this is really kind of, in some sense, supposed to be kind of a, a, a geometric idea. So, so X really will be some kind of, you know, Calabia threefold. And we'll be interested in maybe some kind of, you know, curve counting on it. In the sense, for instance, of you know, let's say Rahul's lectures. So to do that, I would, you know, for instance, I could, you know, first fix a curve class on X. And then if I'm working, for instance, in Grumble Witten theory, I would take this kind of, you know, Ma uh, stable mapping space where I could, I would take a genus, I would look at the stable mapping space, uh, ma uh, space of stable maps, look at the corresponding, you know, Grom of Witten invariant in this class with this genus, which is now some rational number. And then I could, you know, form some kind of generating series for these. Okay. Or what we've been doing, which is more sheaf theoretically, is we can consider this kind of PT perspective where I take stable pairs. And so here the object would be maybe what I'll call ZPT, where I take um, one plus the sum over beta comma N, and I take these PT virtual degrees where N here is indexing the uh, Euler characteristic of the one-dimensional sheaf. And so the idea is, you know, even, even if I fix beta, there's still kind of infinitely many numbers associated to both of these uh, theories, just because here I have to sum over the genus, here I sum over this kind of value of N. And kind of this proposal of uh, Gopu Kumar and Vafa from, you know, the 90s was that, you know, there should really only be finally many numbers that are kind of controlling these kind of generating series. When they were working, this kind of sheaf theory perspective wasn't around yet. So they were really talking about the from the Witten side. And so the way, the way that we kind of think about this, you know, you could try to think about what they were proposing geometrically, although this is not really how they phrased it, was that, you know, you have this Calabi out threefold. Imagine kind of you perturb the complex structure so that all the embedded curves and X are kind of, you know, smooth and isolated. You can't really do this, but you can kind of imagine. So you have maybe curves of a different genus in this class beta, but maybe not just class beta, maybe all the, all the curve classes, you know, why not? And then imagine that there's some kind of, you know, count of these, you know, some kind of what I'll call ng beta, some count of these. Uh, how 
if you were in this ideal situation, you could try to ask how would these kinds of embedded curves contribute to each of these you know, uh, generating functions. And so for instance, on the Grom of Witten side, the proposal is the following kind of formula. So, so what do I mean by contribute? Well, okay, if I have this embedded curve, well, it'll, it'll contribute to you know, the corresponding Grom of Witten invariant uh, for G and beta, but it also contribute to a bunch of other Grom of Witten invariants because I could take a higher genus curve and map it onto this one. So there's kind of every curve contributes to you know, many, many different coefficients via kind of multiple covers. And so when you try to kind of, you know, make this heuristic a little bit more precise, what you get is a kind of proposal. Oh, forgot the, the variables here. Expressing this kind of gromov witten series in terms of some kind of, you know, you know simpler invariance. So I'll put, I'll put a GW here in parentheses just to indicate that right now I'm thinking of the Grom Witten potential. Okay, okay. Maybe it doesn't really matter so much what the exact formula is. Okay. I'll call this maybe equation one. And similarly, you know, on the on the stable pair side, you could ask the same thing. How does one of these curves contribute to kind of all the different, you know, stable pair invariants? If you again try to make this heuristic precise, you kind of end up with the following kind of expression. And again, a single contribute curve contributes not just to class beta, but two beta and so on. And that's kind of what, what this K is doing here. And so in either perspective, this kind of leads you to a conjecture, which is that either of these series has an expression like this, uh, where so the con kind of conjecture that you're led to is that there exists integers, ng beta, which are defined when g is greater than equals zero, um, and only finitely many are non-zero for fixed beta. Such that these equations hold. So this is the kind of conjecture that you're kind of led to from this perspective. And actually, I mean, one thing you can do, so the first one is equation one, the second is equation two. And, you know, one way this kind of subject has developed, uh, you know, over the years is that you actually could take, for instance, you could take equation one as a definition of these integers. You could kind of formally take this generating series and, you know, expand it out like this. And then when you do that, then there's something to check. You still you have to check that whichever definition you take satisfies the kind of conditions of this conjecture. So this property here, and then become, becomes a conjecture. Even though from the heuristic, this, this property was kind of automatic. Uh, so for instance, actually, I mean, in the, in the on the Grom of Witten side, so you start off with the Grom of Witten potential, you kind of take this expansion, you get these quantities. It's op not obvious that these quantities are even integers, let alone that they have these properties. Um, but this has actually now recently been proven. So now this approach 
just earlier this year, I think this has been announced by, um, uh, let's see, Alex Doan, uh, INL, and Walpuski. So there, I mean, this kind of naive picture where you actually have finally many embedded curves is definitely not true, but instead they kind of, you know, work directly with this kind of definition and prove that it has the integrality properties and the finiteness properties that you want. You could instead kind of take perspective two, meaning the stable pair series. And then this is a kind of a stronger version. I, I alluded to this in my lecture yesterday. This is kind of like a stronger version of this rationality theorem that I kind of sketched at the beginning of yesterday's lecture. And in this formulation, it's still open. This is still open. One thing I like about this uh, conjecture. So the conjecture is that you kind of can, you could, there exists an expand, you know, you, there exists an identity like this. And, you know, formally there's always some kind of identity like this, uh, but the, um, where you allow genus, the, G, the genus uh, index to be negative. So there's always a formal identity like this. But then you need to show that only the kind of non-negative genus terms uh, contribute, which is of course what you would expect if you were supposed to think of these as coming from embedded curves, uh, embedded connected curves of genus G. And this is still open. And again, one thing that's cool about this is that you know the, the rationality statement from last time would be true if you just took, for instance, the naive topological Euler characteristic. This version really requires this kind of you know virtual structure to see. But th this approach is very different from the original paper. So what um, what these guys originally did was that they actually had a direct well, physical definition as the weight spaces of some representation on the cohomology of some fixed moduli space, some, some moduli space of brains. So there's one single moduli space, you take its cohomology now, not some kind of virtual count, and then you kind of, you know, mess around with it a little, and that kind of gives you the finitely many integers that kind of govern both of these generating functions. And so, I mean, this is reminiscent of kind of this McDonald formula that I kind of started uh, on uh, Monday's class with. Or kind of on one side, you have you know this kind of generating function of Hilbert schemes on a smooth curve, and on the other side, you kind of have this kind of cohomology of a single space, just the Jacobian of the curve with some kind of prefactor. And so you know over the years, there's been kind of a number of efforts to kind of try to make um, make this idea precise, actually come up with some kind of direct definition that you could then compare with these other enumerative theories. And so this is kind of an old, this is a story that kind of goes back. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of explain today the kind of the latest iteration of this kind of proposal, but it goes back to work of uh, Asano, Saito, Takahashi. And then there was some work of Cam and Lee. And then this kind of latest version is, you know, a proposal of myself and uh, you can over. But okay, so this is the goal. The goal is that, you know, we have, you know, there's some kind of, you know, expression like this and we want to kind of directly, you know, find a way of studying these kinds of numbers. And ideally it should be something close to what their proposal was. So something kind of cohomological. Okay. 
So, so what is the mathematical setup? And so again, this is inspired very much from the ideas in their paper where, you know, what they were looking at was something that looked like, you know, a, a one dimensional sheet. If the curve was smooth, they were looking at the Jacobi, you know, some, the Jacobian of the curve. And in general, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the moduli of one dimensional sheaves on X. So this is going to be like the analog of taking the Jacobian on the right hand side. So it's similar to taking stable pairs, except without the section. Okay, so the more precisely, what I'm going to define is this. I'm going to take M beta of X, where it's the moduli space of E is a, a one dimensional pure sheaf, where again, the support of this sheaf is in class beta. And then I'm going to fix the Euler characters to be equal to one. Okay. And then satisfying some kind of stability. So what is the notion of stability that I want to take? We'll say that E is stable. So E has all the characters one. E is stable if for all subsheets, um, the Euler characteristic is less than or equal to zero. And it turns out, I mean, this is just kind of a, a a, a fortunate accident of looking at chi equal to one, that this is equivalent to just, you know, Giesecker stability for any, usually with Giesecker stability, you have to pick like a polarization or something. And it turns out in the case of chi equals one, it's just independent of the polarization. And that's the nice thing about picking chi equals one. Oh, you could ask what happens for other values of chi, and that's what I'll talk about uh, later on. And so again, you know, heuristically, you know, if I fix a curve, then the contribution of that curve to this moduli space is just going to be the, you know, the, the uh, rank one uh, sheaves uh, on that curve pushed forward. And so in particular, this moduli space is going to be equipped with a map. So the Chow variety of X, so the Chow variety The, the Chow variety, which uh, parameterizes yeah, effective one cycles on X, meaning a point in this variety here corresponds to just some formal linear combination of curves with, uh, with non-negative coefficients. And this map is just, I take a sheaf and I just send it to its cycle theoretic support. Now this kind of, this is, I should say, this is kind of a weird thing in the sense that, you know, all the moduli spaces we generally look at are, you know, they're like moduli spaces. They represent some functor on scenes and so on. The Chow variety isn't really like that. It's kind of constructed, you know, classically as just as a variety. So even really thinking of this as a scheme, uh, there's been some recent work of, Baranowski, which maybe does something like this, but in general, I mean, that's not something we have access to. Um, but for now, this is, you know, this is really the best we can do. We want to take a sheaf and we just remember, want to remember the support of it. So in particular, if I fix a, a point in the Chow variety corresponding to a smooth, um, smooth curve, uh, it's pre-image in this moduli space is exactly the kind of degree D, uh, de, sorry, the degree G line bundles. Okay. 
But then if I have a much more complicated one cycle, the fiber of this map is going to be crazy. I'll try to give some examples. And so, okay, so the idea, and again, um, this is the motivated by kind of this original paper, is that we want to kind of, you know, decompose something like the cohomology of M beta according to the contributions of curves of different genus. So if I have a, you know, a curve of genus G, let's say a smooth curve, then it's going to contribute uh, kind of this Picard is going to contribute this basically the factor of the Jacobian, which to the cohomology is going to be just this, you know, the cohomology of a torus, so one plus y to the two g. And I'm going to put a little shift here to make it so it's actually symmetric around uh, around y to the zero. So it's like a palindromic polynomial. And then if I had, let's say, let's say I had a kind of a, a family of curves, so some kind of, you know, this is, this is a pretty unlikely situation. Let's say I had kind of a family of curves, um, some kind of constant family of curves inside of X. Then the corresponding, when I look at M beta, and these, you know, I get some kind of, you know, pick G cross B mapping to B. Yeah, so maybe uh, so, so, so the idea is that just based on the fact that a curve of genus G should kind of contribute something like this to the cohomology, what I want to do is kind of decompose cohomology of M as a sum of terms like this. And then the kind of coefficient of you know this term in the expansion would be like the genus G contribution. And so then if I had, for instance, just a, a family, a constant family of this fixed curve of genus G in the kind of moduli space, I would end up with a constant family of this Jacobian. And I would like to weight this by um, just the Euler characteristic of the base. So the idea is that something like this would contribute this factor, this cohomology of this torus, weighted by the Euler characteristic of the base. All right, so let's see how we can kind of try to execute that. So the kind of the first case, which is wildly unrealistic, is when kind of everything inside is smooth. So let's say M beta is smooth. This chow variety is smooth. And this map is smooth. Okay. But maybe the chow variety is disconnected, so it has like pieces parameterizing curves of genus G and then another parameterizing curves of genus you know, H. So there's still something going on here. And again, if I take a point, the fiber of it is gonna be this. Part. And so if I want to kind of, you know, mimic what I did in this kind of constant case, what I can do is I can just take the constant sheath on M, uh, push it forward to my chow variety, which you know, everything is smooth. So this thing, if I look at the cohomology sheaths of it, this is just going to be like a local system over this chow variety. And then I can take its Euler characteristic, which is kind of what I was doing here when I weighted the constant family by the Euler characteristic of the base. In that case, this local system would just be constant. And then if I decorate this with, uh, you know, y to the power representing the cohomological degree, some kind of appropriate shift, so it's centered around zero, this is going to be uh, symmetric.
and sending y goes to one over y. Again, this is just you know by the you know relative lefts. And so in particular, I can expand it. We have a question from here. From the yep. Room. So um, what's up with the higher rank um, sheaves on the, on the curve? Oh, yeah, right. So, so if I have a higher rank sheaf supported on the curve, the corresponding cycle would be like two times the curve. And, and so something like that could, in fact, contribute here. OK. Was that your question? Yeah, so I'm still right now in this kind of ideal situation where I have like, I'm thinking about the curves as being reduced. But if I have a cycle that's like two times C, then there are absolutely situations where like a rank two bundle on that curve would con would just contribute. And it would, the point is that the corresponding cycle theoretic support would be two times the curve C. And those will kind of contribute to these numbers. Now you're taking just primitive beta or? Uh, well, right now, I mean, right now, yeah, right now beta, yeah, right now everything here is, um, yeah, in this case one, which is the kind of unideal situation, I'm thinking of this Chow variety as just parameterizing smooth curves inside of X. Okay, so not with no multiplicities, in particular primitive. And then I'll kind of, you know, work my way up to the more general case. Maybe, 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 yeah, it's possible that trying to do it slowly like that makes it more confusing. But right now, this is kind of a, this case one is basically, you know, too naive. But I want to just kind of spell out what it means to kind of take this kind of series and expand it out in terms of the cohomology of these different Torah. And so um, because this Laurent, this Laurent polynomial is symmetric and goes to, in y goes to one over y, I can just expand it out in a base in a basis of these contributions of Torah. So this will be some finite sum. These will be integers. Uh, they will only kind of live when the genus is greater than or equal to zero. And then this is, in some sense, the kind of definition. And this was, you know, this was again proposed originally by kind of Hasono, Saito, and Takahashi to handle this kind of case. And this, in, you know, in the, the very few nice cases where you actually are in this situation, this does in fact match up with the predictions coming from the Grimov Witten invariance. Okay. So the next case, which already introduces a wrinkle, is when let's say the moduli space is smooth. And let's say the Chow variety is smooth. But the map is no longer smooth. Maybe the map is, has some singularities. This would happen, for instance, if I had a family of curves that developed singularities, which almost always happens. Okay. And then, you know, this proposal here doesn't really make any sense because um, these cohomology sheaves aren't, uh, I don't have the symmetry anymore. So this is not a palindrome. First of all, they're not going to be local systems. Maybe that's not a big deal, but the, I, I needed the symmetry in order to expand it out in terms of the cohomology of a Torah. And so here's kind of a, a, just a simple example of the breakdown of this, of this symmetry that I want to write down, uh, which is that let's say I had like a, just a constant family E cross P1 over P1. And then I blow it up at a point. And so, um, so the original projection is pi, this blow up map is tau, and this composition I'll call pi tilde. So I just want to indicate, you know, the failure of this kind of, the failure of this uh, uh, relative Lefschetz theorem, the failure of the symmetry, and then we'll see how to fix it. Um, so if I calculate push forward of the constant sheaf upstairs, the smooth surface all the way down to P1. Oops. I can kind of push forward in two steps. Okay. 
on the first step, when I just kind of blow, I just do the blowdown map, um, this push forward to the constant sheaf, well, there's the, it turns out there's a constant sheaf on my original surface. And then I have that extra um, P1, that extra, uh, the exceptional locus gives me an extra class in degree two. So if I think about the sheaf theoretically, I get a skyscraper sheaf at the point that I'm blowing up on, but I have to put it in degree two. And then if I push this forward all the way down to P1, what do I get? I get kind of Q in degree zero. I'm gonna get, uh, I guess E was an elliptic curve. So I got Q two in degree one. And then in degree two, I get, you know, two things. Okay. Which violates the symmetry. So the, ideally once I shifted everything, you know, this first term and this last term should be the same and they're not. And if I took Euler characteristics, then I would not get something that I could expand out. And so instead, one solution, it's not clear that this is the right solution in this case, but one thing that would at least solve that problem is to take, um, instead of taking the kind of cohomology sheaves, I could take the perverse cohomology sheaves after pushing forward. So in this example, for instance, what happens is that if I take this perverse cohomology sheaves, so now these are no longer sheaves, they're perverse sheaves, uh, and I kind of, you know, shift, instead of pushing over the constant sheaf, I push forward the shift by two, so this thing is also perverse. These again satisfy the symmetry that I want, they satisfy the And so K and minus K will give me the same object. And so how does that work in this example? Well, um, what happens in this example Okay, after shifting by two, it's the same push forward. I've already worked out what the answer is, but now I have to kind of, you know, regroup them according to their kind of perverse degrees. So the Q gets shifted by two, this is, then I get, you know, this and then this. And then what happens is that uh, this term is the kind of degree negative one term. And then these two terms together give me the degree zero term. And then finally this term is in degree plus one. And so now it's again, kind of symmetric around zero. Why is that? Well, it's just that on, a, on, on this base P1, Q isn't perverse, Q shifted by one is perverse. And then QP without the shift. And so that automatically kind of takes this kind of skyscraper sheaf that was causing me problems and moves it into the middle, restoring the symmetry. And so I can try to do that in general. So if I take, again, I'm in the situation when M is smooth, but the map is singular. Again, this is originally due to Asono, Saito, and Takahashi. I can just take what I did originally in the kind of case where everything is smooth and just replace taking the cohomology sheaves with these perverse cohomology sheaves. Okay, so again, I have to do some shifting to get things centered around zero. But the first statement is because of this, you know perverse hard left shift, this is now again, palindromic and uh, this is, you know, this is symmetric around as, with Y goes to one over Y. And so just formally, I can always expand it in terms of the, uh, the cohomology of my abelian varieties.
And this already, I mean, th what's striking here is the, the use of kind of having to take kind of uh, these kinds of perverse cohomology sheaves. And this is already kind of works in lots of interesting cases. So, um, so I was going to give a couple of examples. One, some of these, I, I think I, I was going to ask uh, Jun Liang uh, to do in the, the uh, Q and A session tomorrow, um, just because they're they're nice. You know, it's it's not it's always nice to do some computation. So, for instance, one kind of basic example is where you take x over s as a elliptic Calabiad threefold. So S is some surface, and you know it's the easiest to work in the case where you have uh, integral fibers. And for beta, we could just take the class. Um, of a fiber. In that case, if you look at what the moduli space is, so again, it'll be one dimensional sheaves, scheme theoretically supported on the fiber. And that ends up being the same as taking, picking an elliptic fiber and taking a rank one uh, torsion free sheaf on it and pushing it forward. So this ends up, you know, because the fibers are all genus one curves, the moduli space of rank one sheaves on it just recovers the curve. So the moduli space as I vary which fiber I'm looking at is just isomorphic to X. The chow variety in this case, which is you just forget the sheaf, just remember the support is just telling me which fiber it is. So the chow variety is just S. And this Hilbert chow map is just the original elliptic vibration. And so you can then just do the calculation here. So that if you calculate um, this push forward, what you end up getting, you know, in the different perverse degrees is, you know, the perverse cohomology in degree negative one and one is just the constant sheaf. And then you get something in the middle. <laughs> But you can, you know, it's something, but it's all you need to care about are really the kind of Euler characteristics. And so when you feed this into the definition, what you get is the genus one Goku Kumar Vafa invariant from this definition that involves these kind of outer terms. And so this just gives you the Euler characteristic of the base. The genus zero is kind of determined, you know, it's kind of what's left over. And it ends up being just the Euler characteristic of the total space. You see, if you look at this expression, maybe it's not totally obvious. If I plug in y equals negative one, only the genus zero term lives on the right. And so on the left, you just get the Euler characteristic of the sheaf upstairs. So this, this kind of thing is always true. And so the, 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 then the thing to check is that this actually matches what you expect from the Gromowitten side. So this matches, this is not a hard calculation. Um, there's a more kind of striking check for me, which I'll kind of talk about next time, tomorrow, where you really have to kind of, you know, use this kind of perverse filtration to get the right answer, which is where you take um, X in this case would be the total space of the canonical bundle and P2. And then you, so if you, if you think about it, you know, uh, stability forces the sheaves to be really, you know, scheme theoretically supported on the zero section. So M beta of X really is just some moduli space of one dimensional sheaves on P2. And the map to the Chow variety is just the map to the, like the linear system. And so if you at least restrict to the locus of let's say reduced curves, this kind of perverse you know, cohomology, 
is exactly what you need. To match the uh, contribution from the, the the curve counting theory, and I'll I'll explain this next time. I just want to kind of indicate th there's there are really situations where you actually really need the uh, perverse cohomology to get the right answer, and then it kind of matches up beautifully. All right, but still, this case has you know kind of um, a restriction on it, which is that I assume you have a lot of smoothness still. So then kind of, you know, case three, what if M beta singular? And then, you know, then again, everything, what I've said so far breaks down. So you again, don't have, this is kind of now a really strange object. You see before I was using the fact that the constant chief after a shift is perverse on a smooth variety. And so here, this is no longer gonna be true. This is no longer symmetric. And also it's kind of the wrong thing. You want something that you know detects the virtual structure. And so the idea is, uh, Well, this is maybe not so surprising because we spent you know a whole lecture developing it is to use um, this sheaf uh, from yesterday. So this was again, this was a perverse sheaf on my moduli space. And it was self-dual. This is some property just of vanishing cycles. Meaning if I take the Verdier dual of phi, I get phi again. And so why is that important? Well, it means that if I look at this proper map from M beta to Chow beta, it means that the symmetry is going to be kind of guaranteed for me, the symmetry that I want. Oops. That just kind of follows from, basically just follows from properties of this dual. And so then again, now I can just take the same definition <laughs> that I did in case two, but replace the constant sheaf on M with this new thing. So this is the kind of definition, which is still slightly provisional for a reason I'll explain in a second. And this is this, this is kind of proposed in this work I did with uh, Yukonobu a couple of years ago. Uh, is that I again take this generating functions of these, you know, Euler characteristics. This is a Laurent polynomial symmetric with y goes to one over y, and then I can just expand it out. Into the co contributions of Jacobians. And again, just completely just on just general grounds, these numbers are, you know, integers because they're coming basically by alternating, you know, the, the linear combinations of these Euler characteristics. Since everything here is a Laurent polynomial, only finally many are non-zero for fixed beta. Again, if I stick in y equals negative one, it picks out the gene of zero term on the right. And on the left, I just get the Euler characteristic. If I plug in negative one, I'm just getting the Euler characteristic of the sheath upstairs. Which 
by how we were you know, thinking about the sheet, this is just the virtual number for my moduli space of one dimensional sheets. And this is, again, this is something that we expected. This is expected. You know, if you kind of believe all these conjectures that I stated at the beginning of my uh, of the lecture, then this is this kind of thing is expected by uh, by the other conjectures. That this should calculate the gene is zero go go for Cromarbor Boston variant. This is kind of something that was proposed by Sheldon Katz kind of before before these other approaches were developed. We have a question, David. Uh -huh. uh, so, so these are the um, graded pieces of the perverse filtration on the cohomology of the vanishing sheaf, right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, but yes, uh, graded pieces, yes. And, and in some sense, there's also this Hodge filtration on this, uh, on this cohomology of the vanishing sheaf. Is there some relation expected between this two No, I mean, in general, they're just different. I mean, what you see, what's interesting, um, What's it, yeah, what's interesting is that you can try to take, yeah, you can, so you can try to take a definition that's more Hodge theoretic. So in general, in general, they're just different, I think. But, um, you know, you could ask, why are we taking uh, the perverse cohomology sheaves as opposed to something that's like involves like the weight filtration or the Hodge filtration, something that's a little bit more um, like motivic. And, and the short answer is it just gives the wrong answer. Um, so, so, you know, I mentioned before this kind of Cam Lee proposal the Kim Lee proposal is basically to kind of do something with like the weight filtration on this cohomology. And that's easier to calculate, but it just gives the wrong answer in, in, in kind of various cases. All right, so did, I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Is that, is, is that you, Georg? Yeah, it's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let me just, I mean, so I'm going a little slower than I anticipated. So what I'll do is um, there's another example, which I, I guess I will leave this for Jun Leong to do also. <laughs> that is not seen by can you say it again? Oh. So there's new information contained in this perverse filtration that is not seen by this mixed Hodge structure, whatever. Yeah, well, this for, I mean, depends on what you mean by the mixed Hodge structure, but if you forget cohomology and only remember like, you know, like HPQ or something like that, then then you lose the information. Yeah, yeah. as far as we can tell, we try we tried for a while to come up with the definition along those lines, and uh, it, you know there's there's just there are some examples where it just gives the wrong answer. And so maybe maybe I guess I'll end up doing an example of that at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture. But let, so let, one example where you can kind of see. Um, which is useful for seeing how the kind of vanishing cycles kind of helps out is uh, where you take um, a nodal curve, like a nodal rational curve, genus one, and I embed it in kind of some rigid way into a Calabiat threefold. Um, and then I consider just this, you know, see what this definition spits out. In this case, the moduli space uh, again, this is you, you're looking for things that are essentially rank one torsion free sheets on this curve push forward. So at least set theoretically, you get the curve again. But actually, there's some kind of non-reduced structure at the point. So there's some kind of non-reduced. Okay. And then if you then feed this kind of you know definition, <laughs> you get you know you, what you get is you get uh, the genus one invariant is one. And then the gene is zero invariant is also one. It's uh, g is zero, and then and this is a calculation you can do. And again, this you can do the corresponding stable pairs calculation because you just using the Baron function or something like that, and you recover exactly this. And if you did just the constant sheaf, you would get kind of a different answer. Okay, so okay, let me just mention one thing though, which is that I stated this is a provisional definition. And why is it a provisional definition? Um, well. It's because of something I said last time, which is that to define this sheaf, you don't just need the moduli space, you also need an orientation on it. So, and I kind of skip that. Okay. 
And it really matters, actually. If you picked a different orientation, you would get different invariants. Like, so for instance, in this example here, this rigid nodal curve example, uh, you have another choice of orientation. And I picked one to give you the right answer. And if you pick the other one, you'll just get a different answer, which is incorrect. And so uh, how do we pick it? Well, okay, so this is kind of, again, something that you know was needed just experimentally. So I have my moduli space. We say an orientation is Calabi Yau if it's restriction to kind of the fibers of this map to the Chow variety are trivial. And the conjecture, which in general we don't know how to show, is that these exist. If they exist, actually, it doesn't matter which one you pick, you'll get the same answers. But then, um, but then the, the kind of correct definition is, you know, define the Gopal Kumar Vafa invariance, um, just as I did before, but using the sheaf of vanishing cycles for a Calabi Yau orientation. And so I'll, when I do some examples uh, tomorrow, you know, all the examples that we know of have this property, but you have to make sure you choose the right one. So like for instance, in this kind of rigid curve example, uh, the Chow variety in this case is just a point. So what's going on here is that you have to pick your orientation. So that it's just, you know, trivial. So it's, you know, basically, oh, and if you instead picked a different two torsion line bundle, you would just get something else. Okay. And so then, okay, so then what is the conjecture? So now the kind of key conjecture is that, you know, this is computing what we want it to compute, which is that if you like the kind of These integers defined using this kind of cohomology of M beta agree with the integers defined using the uh, kind of stable pairs theory. So again, as a reminder, this was defined by taking you know, the logarithm of this kind of generating function and expanding it out. And so for, okay, so in, in general, because of this logarithm, it looks a little complicated in that if you specialize to the case when beta is like irreducible, so it doesn't decompose, uh, then, you know, then this identity becomes a little easier to understand on the, on the stable pair side. Well, maybe I'll, uh, I might be, I, in my notes, I go. I was a little sloppy with the plus or minus q, so I, I think I, sh I think this is how I should do it. Um, so if, if beta is irreducible, then I don't really have to worry about this logarithm so much. And then and then the statement becomes kind of clean. What it's saying is I'm going to take on the one hand I take the PT series, on the other hand I take um, this kind of Goku Kumar. Vafa expression. And then the thing on the numerator is just this original kind of perverse uh, So the idea is that if I have an irreducible curve, I take the PT series on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I'm just getting in the numerator. This, uh, this thing obtained by taking the uh, perverse cohomology uh, of the sheaf of vanishing cycles. Um, and in so particular- <laughs> Is the NG beta here? Say what? The NG beta in this formula, is it NG beta PT? Oh yeah, sorry, GV, yeah, let's say that. So maybe this oh, is- okay. Well, I mean, the conjecture is that they're the same. So, so the idea sure. is that, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Um, and so this is, again, this really is, if I kind of specialized even further, um, So for instance, in the situation where uh, I just have a smooth curve and you know all of these complexities that we had to introduce for the virtual structure go away. So let's say that the Baron function is identically you know, one and uh, this chief of vanishing cycles is just the constant chief up to a shift. Then this is really is, this is, this really is just the McDonald formula. where I'm taking on the left-hand side, the Euler characteristic of the Hilbert scheme of points and the right-hand side, the cohomology of the Jacobian. And so in general, this is kind of what I, this is kind of what I meant at the, at the beginning of my first lecture is that, you know, this picture gives some way of, you know, promoting this to study, you know, much more singular curves. And so I guess I'll stop here. What I'll do next time is give, you know, <laughs> some examples in just the examples where we can actually kind of prove this. And in particular, there's some very general class of examples where we can prove this kind of, prove this conjecture. And so I, I'll try to talk about that in particular, say something about the, uh, the techniques of proof that let you actually study something like this. Because when you look at it right now, it seems kind of hopeless because you both have this very mysterious per sheaf of vanishing cycles, which is very hard to get your head around. And then you also have to take this kind of perverse cohomology on the Chow variety, which is also kind of hard to get your head around. And so at least in the cases where we understand well what's going on, it's just that um, those constructions while kind of mysterious also have good formal properties that let you actually prove this kind of statement in many cases. Um, so I guess that's what I'll do uh, tomorrow. Thank you. So we have, a, I think, a question in the Q&A first. Is there a way to see or reason to expect that these Kova Kumar Bapa numbers are deformation invariant oh. or compact threefold? Yeah, absolutely. We, really that's, the, that is, I think, the, that's like the big mystery. Yeah, so, right, so I'll give an example. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the short answer is that's like, I think if that were true, then this conjecture would definitely be true. But in fact, we don't know how to see that. Um, and so I, in fact, it's possible that maybe it's not true. <laughs> but nevertheless, we have some examples. There'll be one kind of example that uh, you can open up like a lot where you actually see the deformation invariance kind of, you know, by hand, or you just calculate it in kind of interesting examples. And it's a really non-trivial statement. And so I should say with this conjecture, I mean, you know, I, my, my feeling about this conjecture, uh, is that um, like for, for local geometries, I, I have a pretty good amount of confidence in this conjecture. For compact geometries like the, like the quintic threefold, then it's less clear what's going on. And you know, you know, the thing is that like, um, you know, this is already the third iteration of this kind of, you know, uh, of, of, of this conjecture. So, you know, it would be a little, you know, it would be, I think a little naive to assume that maybe this is the final settled form of it. Um, that said, you know, in the, in these kinds of local geometries, then I'm much more optimistic. I mean, those are the cases where we can really prove some stuff. Um, and so, I mean, this, this conjecture, for instance, even if you take local P2, um, it's open. I'm very confident in that case, but we, we can only prove it in some kind of, for some open locus of curves in local P2. And I think even understanding what's going on in that geometry, I think is really interesting. Uh, I have some more questions here. Can this... Conjecture of Bopakuma Bafa PT be proven under ideal Calabria 3 geometry? Uh, what do you mean? Sorry, in which geometry? So, so if you assume that every smooth curves are embedded and isolated, then can we prove the conjecture of GB oh. PT correspondence? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. I mean, in, in that case, um, if you were in that really uh, nice situation, um, then I you know, then I think it's basically, you have, you have some, uh, some assumption about the normal bundles. I, I have to think about that. I mean, it's not clear. Yeah, I, I mean, to the extent to which it makes sense, I think you can prove it. It's, uh, you have to be a little careful because that would be some kind of likely non-algebraic deformation. So talking about the sheaf theory is a little delicate maybe. Um, but that certainly is, I, I think basically in that case, you know, the Chow variety is, you know, just a bunch of points. So on the, this kind of calculation on the, the what I'm calling the GV side is, you know, there's nothing going on. So you have to somehow argue that on the, um, uh, the PT side that there's no kind of, you know, secret, you know, you know barren stuff kind of throwing, uh, showing up. Um, but if you're kind of, 
willing to make that assumption, then I think it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a really satisfying <laughs> assumption. I, I, think it, I think it's not entirely a well-posed question because those kinds of, uh, ide that ideal situation is going to have some kind of non-algebraic features to it. So I'm not sure. But not sure. to do that, we probably also need to consider higher rank stable bundles over smooth embedded curves. Yeah, right. So, so, right. So, so usually what will contribute. So, right. If the curve is like sufficiently rigid, then if you look at like two times the curve. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. So, it, so if the curve is sufficiently rigid or, you know, has some kind of generic normal bundle or something like that, you'd expect to see higher rank bundles on the curve contributing like to two times the curve. And um, so where that would fit in in this picture. Yeah. So I guess even in that case, it would not be obvious. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, maybe this question was already answered. So somehow in symplectic geometry, we also have this Kupakuma Rafa invariant. So yeah. do you expect your definition to kind of make sense there? Or? No, definitely not. Yeah, I, I would say no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, of course, I haven't really studied this. So, so am I, I'm still sharing the screen, right? So I mentioned this this very recent work. I haven't really studied this paper. I mean, I, I, I talked to Alex about it like a year ago, but I haven't really studied the. What, what they've done. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see exactly, you know, if, if there are techniques in this paper that would, for instance, you know, uh, for instance, even just understanding um, the kind of PT version of this conjecture, where you have to prove that there are no negative genus contributions, you know, that uh, proving that via this kind of, you know, symplectic approach would be really interesting. And that's something that Don and Walpuski, I think, have been thinking about, like how exactly can one make sense, for instance, of a symplectic version of, of PT invariance? And they have some ideas about that. So my apologies if you said this already, but what's the precise connection between the PT numbers and the promovit numbers? Oh yeah, I, I actually I didn't say that. I mean, of course, I I sort of assume that Rahul will talk about that or something like that. But uh, so, you know, one way of thinking about it, one way of thinking about it is is that um, you know if you know these end, lower ends should be equal to these lower ends, and so therefore that implies some relationship between the Gromov Witten invariance and the PT invariance. And that's, you know, there, that was kind of this, you know, original conjecture relating the kind of sheaf theory approach to curve counting with the kind of Gromov Witten approach to curve counting. So up to some, after some change of variables, these two things are supposed to be the same. Um, and that corresponds to the fact that, you know, this underlying integral and these underlying integers that kind of control this generating function are equal to the, should be equal to the underlying integers that control this generating function. Can I ask one more question? So, but if you study two dimensional sheaves uh, and PT theory, like, should one also expect some sort of Kupakuma Rafa theory there, or like, um, have some integral structure in the PT invariance? Yeah, that's maybe different, right? So, that, uh, so, you, so what you're asking about is if I take two dimensional sheaves on the threefold. Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're asking about? Sorry. About curves, like it's not, you know. I sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't hear half of what you said. Sorry, could you say that again? <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, what's special about curves? You know, like uh, we could take other sheets. You know, they're not. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, a, I mean, yeah. That's, I mean, of course, as you know, there's some kind of, there is some kind of expected structure theory for these two-dimensional invariants, um, but it, it has, it looks really different from this kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. All right, any more questions? Let's thank Tadesh again. <laughs> <laughs>